time uh, and a happy new year. Uh, I am Shai Joseph, the president of uh, Mariale Association of Central Florida. Uh, I'm speaking in English because I know there are people who uh, don't understand Malayalam or uh, in the call. Uh, anyway, uh, last year, uh, we had a lot of volunteers helped us, uh, many doctors uh, helped us with the doctor's panel when we started with the COVID uh, help and uh, planning and, and answering questions. So this year also we thought what would be the right way and the best way to start this year uh, for our community. So uh, this is the idea we came up with uh, to give a class on uh, nutrition and chronic diseases seminar and Dr. Uh, Christina Churian uh, uh, gracefully agreed to uh, take the class. So thank you so much, Christina, uh, for agreeing to take this class. And I welcome uh, every one of you uh, to the class. I'm not going to take any more time. And I hand it over to Anina for formal introduction of uh, Dr. Christina. Anina? Yes. Hello, everybody. Good morning. Um, I'm very happy that you're able to join today uh, for the special Zoom session. First of all, let me start with a confession, saying that I'm not the right person to give this introduction. Um, initially, when we started discussing about this seminar, I was looking for somebody who is following this lifestyle, uh, maybe a vegetarian or uh, who are bringing drastic changes into their lifestyle to have a better and healthy life. But let me confess that it was really hard to find a Malayali who is a vegetarian. So I tried reaching out to a few people. Unfortunately, they have some other commitments today uh, and they're not able to join. So here I am who absolutely love and cherish eating all Indian food, especially non-vegetarian street foods, you name it. But I thought I have one qualification to start uh, this intro regarding Dr. Christina Turing. I know her for many years. In fact, I think the first time I met her, she was a school kid. And I happened to see this young kid grow up in front of my eyes into this beautiful, smart, vibrant, professional lady. And not only that, few years back, I happened to see her talk about something called vegan diet. I never heard of that before. And then I was thinking maybe she's just like all young adults trying to follow something that is trendy and she's gonna give it up in a few months because of her mom's delicious cooking. So that was my expectation. But to my surprise, she stood firm in her ideology. And not only that, I saw her preach it to different, different people around her saying that you should all make this change. And then, you know, I thought there might be something to it because I can see a different person in her. It's one thing to be a preacher and it's a totally different thing to practice it. So I started to respect her more because of that. And right now I can see that she's able to help many people, not only in her professional life, but in her friend circle. So I'm just like every single one of you today, joining to understand what is this? magic behind this lifestyle. Um, so there's only one thing that I want to request to every one of you. I know most of the Malayalis who are Indians who live in the Tampa Bay area know the Churian family. And I don't think I need to give a big introduction. But for those who are not familiar, I just want to let you know that Dr. Christina Churian is a board certified family medicine physician with Baker Medical Group serving the St. Petersburg, Florida area. She completed her graduate degree in biomedical sciences from the University of South Florida in Tampa, Florida, and then earned her Doctor of Medicine from the University of South Florida's Monsani College of Medicine. Dr. Churian is passionate about an educated and disease prevention and reversal through evidence-based nutrition. She holds a certificate in plant-based nutrition via the E. Connell Center of Nutrition Studies. She's a member of American Academy of Family Physicians, the Florida Academy of Family Physicians, and the American College of Lifestyle Medicine. So that's a very formal intro 
of uh, Dr. Christina Chirian. Before we move into our session, I would kindly request everyone to mute. And also, if you can turn off your camera, that will help our event so much. Uh, so if you can do that, that would be great. Also, um, during the session, if you have any questions, uh, please feel, feel free to send it to us privately. You can send it to MACF Tamba or Liju Anthony, or you can share it in the chat and we'll be monitoring it. And during the question answer session, we will discuss that, okay? So without further ado, I would like with much honor and pleasure invite Dr. Christina Cherian. Welcome, Dr. Christina Cherian. Thank you so much for the kind introduction, Anina Um, So uh, I'm really thankful for the opportunity to be speaking to you all today. And so thank you so much for showing up and taking interest. Um, so I'll go ahead and just dive in. Um, uh, so why do we care about what we eat, right? So it turns out that um, the biggest predictor of how we'll die is actually what we eat. So out of when it comes to exercise, smoking, you know, all the other factors out there, the biggest one is actually what we put in our mouth. So um, a little bit of an intro. So the number one cause of, the de of death in the US when it comes down to factors is really the American diet. Um, people, not, people often talk a lot about genetics, but it only really accounts for maybe about 10 to 20% of the risk at most. Um, so what are the top killers in the US? So we have heart disease, cancer, unintentional injuries, um, you know, lung disease, stroke, Alzheimer's, then diabetes, kidney disease, then influenza and pneumonia, and then we have suicide as well. So out of these 10, uh, at least seven of them are actually related to what we eat. So um, heart disease, uh, cancers, uh, even lung disease is affected by what we eat, uh, the risk of stroke, Alzheimer's disease, diabetes, kidney disease, um, all these things are actually affected by, um, by what we eat. So we'll actually be focusing on um, diabetes, heart disease, and cancers because there's so much, um, so many, uh, so many diseases that are actually affected. So heart disease, so that's a leading cause of death in the U.S. and actually also in the world. So it, it causes about one in four deaths in the U.S. And one person dies every 37 seconds in the United States from cardiovascular disease. So we probably know, you know, at least a few people who have passed away from uh, either a heart attack or a stroke. Um, and so it's something that we're very familiar with, unfortunately. Um, now cancer. So cancer is the second leading cause of death in the US. And um, the four most common lung, uh, cancers are lung cancer, colorectal cancer, breast cancer, and prostate cancer. Um, and then we have uh, diabetes, you know, uh, diabetes is a huge one. One in 10 in the US have diabetes and over one in three have prediabetes, which leads to diabetes. Um, in the US, 30 million adults have diabetes and one in four of them don't even know that they have it. Um, it is the fourth leading cause of death in the US as we saw. And it's also the biggest cause of heart failure, sorry, kidney failure, lower limb amputations and blindness. So, and then touching a little bit on India, India actually has the second largest number of type two diabetics in the world. And as a sad statistic, uh, India will actually lead the world in diabetes by 2030. Um, so it is really growing from in, in India. Um, and then turns out, you know, the rates of diabetes, heart disease, cancers, and obesity are all on the rise. Um, so for instance, this is some charts that show um, the prevalence of diabetes in, in the US. So 1995, you can see in 2005, and then 2015, um, just on the rise. So what has changed over the years? So it's not, uh, it's not genetics, because genetics doesn't change, right? Um, it's diet. Diet is the one factor that has changed over the, over the years. So um, 
let's let's dive into that. So in the U.S., there's something called the standard American diet, and um, you know Indians eat slightly different or can eat slightly different, um, but the we also seem to be kind of moving into the direction of the American diet here and there. So 63% of, um, of the American diet is processed foods, which means some food that's modifi modified in some way. 25% um, comes from uh, animal products and then uh, processed plant foods is 6% and then whole plant foods is only another 6% out of our diet. So we'll dive into a bit of this um, a little bit more and I'll explain what's going on. So um, as it turns out, this diet, the standard American diet, you know, the acronym is actually SAD, um, the S-A-D diet. So it is a very sad diet indeed. Um, and unfortunately, animal foods, including meat, chicken, seafood, eggs, and dairy, and that includes your butter, milk, cheese, ice cream, these all, turns out, increases our risk for high blood pressure, diabetes, um, heart disease, which is our number one killer, and breast, prostate, and colon cancers. So um, these foods do uh, increase the risk for it. And so when you see how much of, of the diet is actually coming from animal foods and processed foods, um, it's really important to focus on the diet when we're trying to of, um, change our risk of these diseases. So what's the solution? The solution is a, what's called a whole food uh, plant-based diet. So what this means is we're eating mostly plant-based unprocessed foods. So when you, when you process a food, um, you modify it. And when you modify it, you actually lose a lot of nutrients in the food. Um, so that's what processing a food means. And so this way of eating really emphasizes legumes, which are your beans, chickpeas, uh, lentils, um, things like that. Your whole grains, so like your brown rice, whole grain breads, um, whole grain pastas, um, oatmeal, those types of foods, and vegetables, fruits, nuts, seeds, herbs, and spices. And it discourages most or all animal products. Um, like I mentioned, that includes dairy, meat, chicken, fish, and eggs. Um, so what can, uh, what can eating this way help to help manage? So like I mentioned, diet, so hypertension, diabetes, um, heartburn, irritable bowel syndrome, arthritis, overweight, obesity, asthma, and a lot more. A lot of autoimmune diseases can be affected by um, diet as well. Uh, it is not something that's a panacea, meaning that you know just changing the diet is not a cure-all for everything, but it significantly affects your risk of developing these conditions and um, your quality of life when you do have these conditions. So it is important to note um, so most of these turns out are, are actually rooted in our poor diet and there's a lot more complexity there, but that's the biggest thing. Uh, you know, turns out that um, at some point our food choices really do catch up to us. When we're younger, we feel like we're, you know, like invincible. We can eat whatever we want to eat um, and, you know, we don't really see the effects of it. But it turns out that chronic diseases, they don't magically uh, develop in our 40s. 50s or 60s, um, chronic diseases like, like diabetes and hypertension, they all develop due to lifestyle choices um, over the course of decades, um, ever since you were actually born. So they're actually called lifestyle uh, diseases for this reason. Uh, so now, uh, touching a little bit on diet and heart disease, um, you may know that saturated fat it plays a big role in heart disease. There are a few other factors as well that I won't go into, but this way of eating um, whole food plant-based has actually been shown even back in the 80s to actually reverse some um, heart disease. Now, I'm not saying that'll happen with everyone, but the body has a capacity of healing itself and if we let it, let it do its job by feeding it um, nutrient rich food, um, it's actually able to clear out a lot of that plaque you see in the picture on the right there, um, where um, you see it's kind of narrowing on that left side and then on the right, uh, the flow has been um, 
has been resumed there. So touching on diet and diabetes, I know this is really huge among the um, Indian community. So just gonna give a brief overview of it, but it is quite complex. So insulin, it's a hormone that's produced by our pancreas, right? And it allows glucose to enter its cell where, um, enter all of our cells of our body where the glucose actually belongs. Um, the job of glucose is to be converted to energy. So um, insulin resistance is the hallmark of diabetes. So it's a complex process by which the body really becomes resistant to this hormone insulin. And the, one of the major processes that contributes is actually fat buildup in the liver and the muscle cells. So um, this actually blocks insulin from doing its job in these cells. Um, this fat that builds up, it actually comes from the fat we eat from, the, from our diets and the fat that we wear. So when we have extra weight on us, it contributes to this process. All right. Um, and then diet and cancer, um, there's quite, quite a few links between diet and cancer. So one of them is um, carcinogens or uh, cancer causing substances in cooked meats. So women who eat more grilled, barbecued or smoked meats over their lifetimes may have as much as 47% higher odds of developing breast cancer. Um, we know that processed meats are already linked to col colorectal cancer. Um, and then cholesterol also appears to stimulate the growth of breast cancer cells. When it comes to eggs, these actually also increase the risk of breast cancer um, given in, in women who are having around five eggs uh, a week, for instance. So having, an, having eggs in the morning may not be the best idea. And this can be due to several aspects of eggs, including the cholesterol or something called choline or the protein itself that's found in eggs. Um, on top of that, eggs actually, one egg contains more cholesterol than a Burger King quarter pounder. So all that increases your risk of dying of a heart attack or stroke. Uh, when it comes to dairy, dairy is actually associated with increased risk of breast and prostate cancers. Um, and most of our exposure to hormones comes from dairy and that's what's linked to these, um, these cancers, breast and, breast and prostate. So the other thing is up to 20% of cancers are actually linked to infections. And turns out that with dairy, you have something called bovine, bovine leukemia virus exposure. And that is also something that has been linked to uh, breast cancer. Now, comparing diets versus medications, right? You know, we see a lot of um, patients who, I see a lot of patients who come in and, you know, and in doctor's offices, we, it's normally, okay, you have this disease, well, let's put you on this medication or let's try diet, but if the, if, if you don't listen to that, then let's put you on a medication. And then every time you come in, you, ends up, you end up having to bump up those medications. Well, the difference with diet is that it actually addresses as much as possible the root cause of the chronic disease. The medications don't do this. And so that's why food actually works better than medications. Um, you know, statin medications um, don't work as well as diet for preventing heart attack or stroke. Right? It's a great medication and I prescribe it all the time, but it doesn't do a good as job. Um, then you have the side effects of medications, right? So metformin for diabetes is a very common medication, but it's very much associated with um, side effects like nausea, diarrhea, and a lot of people can't tolerate it. Um, and who wants to live with those side effects, right? Then there are some long-term effects of medication. So one of the other very commonly prescribed medications is, um, is, the, is omeprazole and pantoprazole. These medications, um, also called protonics, you know, they, they actually are used to treat reflux or heartburn. Um, but when taken over the long term, these actually increase your risk of fractures, of pneumonia, of having an infection in your, in your colon called C. difficile infection. Um, and it contributes to vitamin deficiencies. So medications really only act as band-aids um, and you really have to consider the pros versus the cons when you start taking medications. All right, and then um, so we'll kind of go through um, various um, aspects of diet. So, so nutrients, um, 
there are some big uh, nutrients called macronutrients. The big ones are protein, carbohydrates, fat, fiber, and then you also have micronutrients, um, including minerals and vitamins. So we'll kind of touch on all of these, but um, there is a, a tendency in, in nutrition or when you're talking about diet to kind of simplify things into these nutrients, but it's actually a little bit, a lot more complex than that. So I'll touch on that as well. So carbohydrates. So uh, carbohydrates are not, not all carbs are created equal. Um, as it turns out, the lowest rates of diabetes in the world are actually found in populations eating high carb diets. So high carb diets, meaning they're getting their carbohydrates mostly from fruits, vegetables, um, whole grains, um, and uh, legumes, um, because all these foods contain carbohydrates. Um, touching on diabetics, so they, I won't go into it too much, but they should eat low on the glycemic index uh, to avoid spikes in insulin and blood sugar. This is mostly when you have a severe diabetic um, patient who can't handle certain, certain fruits because they actually cause the sugar to spike up. Um, and then it, as it turns out, whole plant foods are actually lowest in glycemic index and more processed foods. Um, including table sugar, um, including, you know, syrups and things are higher in glycemic index. So that's just for diabetics, though. Other people do not need to be concerned about the um, glycemic index. So refined carbohydrates, what are these? You know, they're actually um, foods, carbohydrate foods that have been stripped of their nutrients by food processing techniques. And the more they're processed, the more they're associated with overeating and obesity insulin resistance that we discussed earlier, fatty liver, which is uh, fat accumulation in the liver, um, inflammation, which is a very complex process that plays a role in all major chronic diseases, and also high triglycerides. So we have all sorts of refined carbohydrates. We have some simple refined carbs and complex refined carbs. Um, not to go into too, too much detail, but this, uh, the things that fall into these categories, are sugar, syrups, jams, candy, sweetened beverages like Coke, um, and then also white flour that's used in baking. So the um, refined flour, not whole grain flour, uh, white rice, uh, and then concentrated uh, starches as well. So a little info, uh, infographic here. Um, with the good carbs versus the, the bad carbs. Again, we don't want to kind of minimize it to carbs versus protein versus fat, but um, this gives us a good idea of where we can get our good carbohydrates from. Um, starchy vegetables, uh, beans, lentils, chickpeas, whole grains, fruits and veggies, and uh, pastas, for instance, made from whole grains or legumes. And then on the right side, you see those really highly, highly refined um, sugars that are not so good for us, including, you know, sugary cereals that people do sometimes eat, you know, every day, and including uh, white breads and uh, white pasta, so our normal like spaghetti and, and things like that. Um, so in the US, most of this actually comes from most of the sugars actually come from uh, sweet beverages. So that includes your uh, Coke, sweet tea, um, things like that. And then you've got sweets and snacks and then grains, mixed dishes, dairies, and a very sad 2% is um, only only 2% is from fruits and vegetables. So all right, so on to fat. Um, so all foods containing fat have a mix of different types of um, fat. So you may have heard about saturated fats and unsaturated fats. Turns out the saturated fats are the uh, ones that lead to chronic disease. Um, so diets high in saturated fats are contribute to type two diabetes. Um, and then those are actually mainly found in animal foods, including chicken, including dairy, including um, fish even. But a few plant foods such as coconut, coconut oil, and palm oil are also high in this unhealthy fat. And then the healthier fats, unsaturated fats, are mainly found in plant foods like nuts, seeds, olives, and avocados. Um, out of, so saturated fat, chicken and cheese are actually the two main 
sources of saturated fat in the American diet. So I always hear, you know, um, people say that, you know, chicken is like a health food or they consider, you know, lean meats and things like that as a healthy option when compared to other foods. But as it turns out, um, it's actually the biggest, you know, sources of saturated fat in the American diet. So this is pulled from the National Cancer Institute. And I know it's a little small, but you can see here the top foods. Number one is regular cheese. Uh, all right, number two is pizza. So that includes the cheese and everything else on it. Three grain-based desserts. So that's like muffins and, and um, cookies and things like that. Then four dairy desserts. So um, that's also your ice creams and things like that. Then five, chicken and chicken mixed dishes. So anything containing chicken, number five and saturated fat. Um, then six is, you know, sausage, Frank. So it goes on and so forth and so forth. Um, you see here number 10, for instance, is reduced fat milk. Top, top source of saturated fat, you know. And then after that, you have whole milk, eggs, candy, butter, all of those things. So when comparing dietary fat, right? People have oftentimes a lot of confusion about what oils to maybe cook with. And so this gives us a good picture of, um, of the healthy fats versus the unhealthy fats. So you'll see the red is the saturated fat. That's the one associated with diabetes and um, heart disease. And so it's actually highest in coconut oil, butter, and palm oil, and lard. So I know I know some people who cook with coconut oil, but as it turns out, it's really not good for us, not good for our blood vessels, not good for our um, diabetes. It's really not good for us. And then the yellow you'll see are the more healthy fats. Um, so if you look at olive oil there, you see it has far less of the unhealthy fats than it does of the healthy fats. So um, I prefer if, if you're going to use oil, you want to use a spray can with the olive oil or um, canola oil or safflower oil you see there. So it's really important to kind of think about. So, um, so fat and heart disease. Um, turns out that you can actually to some degree and not in everyone, but you may be able to see reversal of heart disease, which is the plaque inside the blood vessels of our heart um, in exclusively plant-based diets. That means in people who choose to eat um, only plant-based. Uh, and that, that would mean like 10% of their total calories come from fat. No need to count or anything like that. In a healthy diet, there's no need to count for macronutrients, right? And then um, zero cholesterol. Cholesterol is really only found in animal products. Like I said, like egg is a huge source of cholesterol, meat. Um, and so in, in people who actually eat this way and then someone who's had a heart attack or a stroke before, the biggest thing is that you wanna prevent the next one because it could be your last, right? So, um, so you want to really shift to um, a plant-based diet as much as possible to prevent that risk and to undo some of that plaque that's sitting in the arteries of the brain and the heart. All right, so looking into, so we said we want 10% roughly of the total calories um, in our diet to be from fat. So just to give you an idea, I know there's a lot of numbers here, but to give you an idea of um, how we can um, make sure we're getting just 10% from fat, um, these are, this is the fat content in animal versus plant foods. So on the left here, you'll see beef with 30%, 36% of its calories from fat, pork 37, chicken breast 49%, all right, turkey, salmon, um, beef, egg is 63% of its calories from fat, milk, even the, what they say, 2%, 2% sounds like such a small number, right? But 35% of the calories in 2% milk come from fat, you know, and then cheese with a whopping 72% of calories from fat. On the other side, if you look at, you know, beans, lentils, brown rice, uh, bread, broccoli, all of these foods, even strawberries, 8% of calories actually come from fat. So a lot of people think that, um, you know, fruits or vegetables don't have fat in them, but they do. Um, and in order to achieve just that 10% of total calories from fat, you can see how on the right, you'd easily be able to 
add those together, right? Um, and then you add on some of the nuts and seeds that are rich in fat and you get the, the amount of fat that you need for a, for a healthy lifestyle. Um, so coming, moving to fiber, um, fiber is something that people don't talk about very much. Um, people seem to be far more concerned about protein, which we'll touch. Um, but most Americans are really fiber deficient and fiber is only found in plant-based foods. Just like bones keep us standing tall, you know, we, we don't have any fiber in our, in our bodies. Um, fiber is the thing in plants that keep it standing tall, that give it the structure. Um, so it turns out that meeting the daily requirement for fiber is associated with reduced risk of developing diabetes. And um, the, there's a 6% risk in, or decrease in diabetes risk for every two grams of fiber eaten. So protein, um, everyone asks me, but where do you get your protein from? Where do you get your protein from? Um, turns out all protein originally came from plants. Um, everything that, you know, cows and chickens and pigs eat, um, you know, they don't, they don't get it from other animals, right? They actually get it from plants. So um, when you actually, uh, when you actually think about it, you know, animals are really the middlemen. All nutrients that the animal had came originally from plants, right? So um, all, all vegetables, grains, nuts, and seeds contain protein. And there's really no need to track the amount of protein that you eat. Um, it'd be good for a fun test and to make sure you're meeting it. But the average vegetarian or vegan meets or exceeds the recommended amount of protein intake. Um, and it also turns out replacing animal protein with plant protein results in a reduced risk for diabetes. Um, Protein deficiency is not something we see in the US. It is something that is only seen in countries where uh, malnutrition is high, you know, places where there is, there's no food, you know, where people are starving. So it's not something that we see in developed countries. Um, and so just to give you a little idea here, a sample, you know, menu for uh, say a 160 pound adult who would require maybe 58 grams of protein. If they have a breakfast with oatmeal and blueberries and walnuts and some soy milk instead of cow's milk. Um, and then they have lunch with some pea soup and some bread with hummus and maybe a salad on the side and some apple and then peanut butter. And then some um, tortillas with, uh, you know, black beans and brown rice, or you could have, you know, rice and lentils, uh, you know, like dal and things like that with some veg vegetables also on the side. You can see it, the protein adds up. There is no need to be um, counting how much protein we get. And then calcium. So calcium is also another, um, another thing that people get concerned about, right? So people think that consuming dairy is the only way to get enough calcium, but calcium is actually a mineral found in the ground. And um, that's why plants grown in the ground are excellent sources of calcium. Um, turns out that, you know, where did the cow get its calcium from? Well, it got it from plants, right? It doesn't eat anything else in order to get it from some other source. They only eat plants. Um, and didn't, didn't come out of, you know, thin air and then just suddenly found in their, in their cow's milk, right? So it, it came from plants. So um, some other, you know, habits that uh, lead to lower calcium are actually tobacco use, um, alcohol use, high intakes of animal protein, so meat and sodium. So salt and um, salt that's also found in, in animal products or sodium that's also found in animal products and lack of both exercise and sun exposure. So vitamin D. Um, but as it turns out in countries where dairy is rarely or never consumed, the osteoporosis rates and the rates of fracture are actually lowest in the world. So um, there's a huge, you know, marketing ploy going on in terms of, um, in, in terms of, you know, people thinking that we really need cow's milk in order to get the calcium. So here are some, you know, plant-based calcium sources. Um, it's good to see. So, you know, you can see that all these foods, collard greens, um, plant milks, tofu, even orange juice, uh, 
tempeh, kale, okra, uh, navy beans, almond butter, um, all of these foods contain calcium and more, more than, more than just these foods. And then moving on to iron. So it turns out there are actually two types of iron. Um, there is one that's um, heme iron, that's blood-based, that's found in animal foods. And there's non-heme iron that's found in plant foods. Um, the heme iron, uh, which is found in animal foods, is actually more easily and readily absorbed, but it might not be as beneficial because our body doesn't have a way to actually excrete excess iron. Um, so this actually leads to buildup of iron in the body and that can cause other issues. Um, turns out that people eating a plant-based diet um, do not actually experience higher rates of iron deficiency than um, meat eaters. And um, the other thing is that plant food sources come packaged with um, so many other nutrients that there's no need to get iron from animals. So, um, and then some uh, plant-based iron sources, and then you can see at the bottom there, there's actually chicken, pork chop, flounder, hamburger, steak. You can see that the amount of iron is actually less per 100 calories um, than for spinach, uh, collard greens, you know, lentils, broccoli, chickpeas. Um, all these foods that we eat do contain iron. So um, again, there's no need to kind of count it or you know keep track of it as long as you're eating a varied diet. So. This is a little picture of the pyramid of the of the of the way that um, the way of eating that is the most beneficial. So, excuse me. At the bottom here, <clears throat> you'll see um, vegetables and fruits. So you want to be eating most of these fruits. These fruits are um, very high in nutrients, and they happen to also be very low in calories. Um, and then you want to eat um, your whole grains, so breads, whole grain pastas, um, you know, brown rice, um, oatmeal. Uh, if you can see the grain, then um, that's best for you. And when it comes to food in general, you want to eat what looks as close to what it looked like when it came out of the ground. So you want to eat food that comes out of the ground and looks as close to what it did when it came out of the ground. So anytime you, you process a food, um, some nutrients are lost. All right, so I'll go into that a little bit more, but diving into whole foods. So we talked about the different nutrients, right? But I prefer to actually um, just consider whole food groups um, because it's kind of easier for us to understand too. There's a lot of misconceptions, like I said, about um, the big nutrients like protein and carbs and fiber and um, so it's it, all, all of those nutrients are found in all of these foods to some degree. So we'll talk about whole foods. So starting with vegetables and fruits. So for each serving, that's a rough handful. The risk of diabetes is reduced by 13% for green leafy vegetables, 10% for other vegetables, and 7% for fruits. So um, the green leafy vegetables are the, the best one for you. So the more color, the better it is for you. So when it comes to vegetables and fruits, you want to select um, unprocessed or minimally processed choices. So the unprocessed foods would be the fresh fruits and the vegetables. The minimally processed ones might be the ones that are you know, frozen, so just very slightly uh, processed. And then moderately, um, oh, here in the minimally processed would also be blended fruits. And then um, moderately processed would be like unsweetened juices. So like your, you know, um, orange juice that's not been processed or canned fruits and vegetables. Um, but as it turns out, you know, when you go from an orange to orange juice, turns out you actually lose like 40% of the vitamin C. So it's always going to be better um, to eat the whole food than to eat something that's just been removed from it. Um, so then you have your highly processed foods. So your sweetened uh, fruit-based desserts, um, then deep fried uh, vegetables like pakoda, you know. So those are more processed and with, um, it, it comes packaged with unhealthy options, unhealthy foods. Um, so then legumes. So these are your beans, lentils, chickpeas, uh, peas, ev everything, any of these under the sun um, are really good for you. And these also re decrease the risk of developing diabetes. Turns out it also, it's also really good 
for um, diabetic neuropathy, you know, when diabetes affects the nerves, it's been found that when you bump up your beans, uh, the number of servings of beans that you eat, it can actually really help with that as well. Um, so when it comes to this, again, you want to select the unprocessed or minimally processed choices. So if you can get the whole um, bean, whether it's, whether it's dry beans or whether it's canned, um, the, both of those, if you can see the whole bean in it, that's going to be the best for you. Minimally processed would be foods like temp, uh, tofu or tempeh, which come from um, soybeans, for instance, and then bean pastas, which you may have seen over the um, in the restaurants that are made from like chickpeas or uh, black beans or soybeans. Uh, those are also minimally processed. And then moderately processed would be like veggie meats that are made from these things. Like they have, you know, soy protein in them, for instance, that's been really, really highly processed. And then also ready to eat canned or frozen bean dishes that contain other oils or fats and things like that. Um, and then the highly processed ones would be like deep fried tofu, where you have the added oils and, um, you know, the more it's deep cooked, the fewer nutrients it has as well. And then the um, salty bean based snacks like chips and crackers and things like that as well. Now whole grains. Um, so these are your whole grain breads, your um, uh, rolled oats, your steel cut oats, your barley, there's millet, there's um, sorghum, there's so many, so many, such a huge variety of whole grains out there. We only know, um, I guess, in the US of a few of them. But um, for every half ounce serving of whole grains, diabetes risk is reduced by 11% for men and 7% for women. Um, so what, what, what even is a whole grain, right? So it turns out that when you refine a grain, so say when you're going from brown rice or whole rice, to um, white rice or you know, basmati rice or jasmine rice, um, the outer part of the grain, which is called the bran, is filled with fiber and some vitamins and minerals. So that's stripped away. And then the inner part called the germ, um, which has a lot of nutrients, including you know, B vitamins, vitamin E, um, healthy fats, now that's also stripped as well. So that leaves this inner part called the endosperm, which has just the carbohydrates part. And there's some proteins and, and vitamins as well. So it just comes with a worse package. So you'd rather have the whole grain than the refined grain. So you get all the potential nutrients. And then for these as well, you want to select the unprocessed or minimally processed choices. So if you can see the grain, that's the best. Sprouted whole grains are great as well. Um, and then this also includes some starchy vegetables. So, um, so your sweet potatoes, your potatoes, um, those are all fine to eat as long as it's not been super processed or had a lot of oil or um, you know, other, other items added onto it. Um, that's gonna be, it's gonna be really helpful for you. And then minimally processed. So um, even like your rolled oats, for instance, they're still fine to eat, although they have been slightly processed. And then you have your um, moderately processed ones. So these are your cereals, um, you know, flaked or puffed grains. Um, anytime anything has been done to these grains, you're going to have fewer nutrients in it. Um, and then highly processed would be your, um, your white rice, white pastas, and then your whole grain snacks with added um, fat and sugar and salt. So that might be your like Ritz crackers and things like that. And then fried starchy vegetables. So that is your French fries um, with the added oil and the salt and all of that. So then you have nuts and seeds. So that's any nut and seed under the um, under the sky. So uh, those eating four or more servings of nuts a week can actually decrease their risk of diabetes by half compared to those eating less than one serving of nuts a week. Um, and so you with nuts, you want to go for variety and for omega threes. So omega threes, I won't go into it too much, but they are um, some of your healthy fats, and they really help to bring down um, what's called inflammation in the body. They also help with um, getting to a normal weight. So 
the food's rich in omega-3, so your chia seeds, flax seeds, hemp seeds, and walnuts. Um, and then plenty of vitamin E is found in almonds, sunflower seeds. You can get a lot of calcium from almonds, chia seeds, sesame seeds. You can get a lot of iron from cashews and other seeds, um, zinc from cashews and seeds, uh, potassium from almonds. Um, and then you see here selenium, you can really only it seems get that from Brazil nuts. So that's why uh, many people actually recommend eating, you know, one Brazil nut a, a, a day or a week, for instance, just to get that amount of selenium, which is one of the um, minerals um, that we actually need in our diet. So, but eating a variety of these foods will make sure that you get all the different nutrients that you need. And again, you want to select the unprocessed or minimally processed options. So if they're whole and raw in their, in their shells, for instance, or if they're soaked or sprouted, that's the best. And then you have your dry roasted nuts and seeds, and then your natural nut or seed butter. So that, you know, if you look at the ingredients list, for instance, for peanut butter, right, you'll see peanuts, um, and then you'll see some forms of oils, maybe more than one, and then you'll see salt, and then you'll see sugar. So the natural um, nut or seed butters are actually the ones where in the ingredients, all it says are peanuts, and then maybe some salt, or just peanuts. It's also something that, you know, if you really wanted to, you could just make them yourself at home. Um, and then so moderately processed would be the ones, like I said, with the added oil or salt um, and like your GIFs, uh, peanut butter and that type of thing. And then the highly processed ones would be the ones that we find in the stores that have the sweet coatings, you know, or the, the, the nut or seed butters with the added sweeteners and added oils and things like that. So um, vegan does not mean healthy. All right, so all of these foods here are, are, are vegan, meaning that they don't have any animal products in them, but they're not healthy for you. There's a lot of sugar in there. We won't go into sugar because that's a whole other thing, but sugar is not very good for us. Refined table sugar is not good for us. And that's what's found in all of these foods, right? So just because it doesn't contain animal products doesn't mean that it's good for you. All right, and then the other thing to uh, keep in mind also, is that meat and cheese alternatives. So like the Beyond Burger, you may have heard of the Impossible Whopper, um, the, the you know, mac and cheese that you can find in the, in the frozen food aisles. Um, these are not health foods. So in order to replicate the taste of meat and the taste of cheese and the texture of, of both of these, you actually have to duplicate the amount of fat that's in the food. So you kind of have to have the same amount of fat protein, carbohydrates to get that same texture. That's really, really hard to do. So they add a lot of um, oil and a lot of processed um, items into it. So if you just look at the ingredients list for these things, you can see that it's not a whole plant food, right? So those are not healthy for us. Um, so I wanted to also touch on obesity. So um, obesity and overweight is becoming a really huge issue in the U.S. and um, it's connected to everything that I've discussed here. But it's a it's a risk factor, independent risk factor for diabetes, heart disease, stroke, and some types of cancer. So even if you don't have diabetes, even if you don't have high blood pressure, even if you don't have these things diagnosed, if you fall into the category of overweight or obesity then you're at a higher risk of developing diabetes, of having a heart attack or having a silent heart attack, right? Or having a stroke. So as it turns out, people eating 100% plant-based have the lowest rates of overweight and obesity. Um, and that's because as it turns out, this diet is naturally low in calories and naturally high in nutrients. And I just wanna to touch on as well, um, how do we find out, you know, if we're at a normal weight or not. Um, that's generally done through what's called the body mass index or BMI. Um, it takes into account your, your weight and your height. And it's not perfect, but it gives us a good idea of whether you're in a healthy um, zone or not. Um, and there are calculators for that um, online that you can find. So weight loss, um, weight loss and diabetes. So actually it turns out that when you lose weight, this often 
can reverse diabetes to some degree. You know, as we talked about earlier with the insulin resistance, right? Um, having extra weight on us builds up in those cells and causes the process of diabetes to happen. Um, and turns out the more, more weight that's lost, the greater the reversal. And so it can really help the body become more sensitive to, um, to insulin. So even just losing five to 10% of your starting body weight really does improve um, insulin sensitivity. So for instance, I had a patient, um, I think uh, uh, she was quite obese and um, she came in with, she was in her twenties, by the way, she came in with an A1C, which many of you may know is a, a screening test for diabetes, A1C of 9.2, which means her blood sugars were sky high. Um, and so what happened, I recommended this way of eating to her and um, she ended up cutting all of it out, you know, cut out the oils as well, cut out the, um, all the animal products. And when she came, and I had started her on one medication too, but when she came back, um, her weight went down only by, you know, maybe 10 pounds or so, which wasn't that much considering her initial body weight, but her A1C went down to 5.2. Um, so into the pre-diabetic range. So even if you don't go down to your normal um, weight, your insulin sensitivity, your diabetes can really be improved. Um, so this is a little picture of uh, calorie density here. Um, this is important to consider when you're someone who's wanting to lose weight or get to a healthy weight, right? So on the left side here in the green zone, you see your fruits, vegetables, you see your um, whole grain. So that's your un, where you see unprocessed CC, that's unprocessed complex carbohydrates, AKA whole grains that we talked about, and then your legumes. So these have, you know, 100 to 600 ish calories per pound. On the right side, you see oils and fats there, um, 400 calories per pound. That's because oils are pure fat and fats have more calories Per, per weight, all right? Then after that, you have nuts and seeds, really great and nutritious for you. But if you're trying to lose weight, you know, your body can use the fat it already has for all the processes it needs to, uh, it needs it for. So for someone trying to lose weight, I recommend cutting out the nuts and seeds as well until you get to a normal weight. And then you got your junk food, lots of fat there as well. And then you have your processed complex carbohydrates that, that orange, um, bar there with processed CC. So that's your refined grains. So your white breads, white pastas, you can see how many more calories it has than your whole grains, right? And then after that, you have kind of your animal products um, in the middle there. And so this is another, um, I made this little chart so that people can see um, a little bit more specifically, you know, it has, for instance, it's got sugars there, sugar in the form of honey, agave, corn syrup, etc. So if you're trying to lose weight, you really want to focus on um, cutting those down or out of your diet as much as possible. Then you've got cheese there, you see 1300 to 1800 calories. So these are like 13 times more, um, a lot more times, uh, times more calories than say fruits, vegetables, etc. So when it comes to, um, when it comes to weight loss, even if you were to eat as many of those foods in the red zone as you wanted to, uh, you would still lose weight, right? And um, on top of that, those foods in other ways, they actually promote weight loss. So, so looking at, for instance, olives versus olive oil, because there's so much, you know, about, about, um, about olive oil, so much kind of controversy. Um, in general, like I said, it's best to get your nutrients in whole plant forms. So that means eat the olives rather than the olive oil. If you need to cook, um, you know, like I said, olive oil is maybe one of the healthier options. So you can use a spray can, for instance. But you should know that one tablespoon of olive oil is maybe 120 calories. Whereas if you were to go to the um, eat just the olives itself, you'd have to eat 20 of those in order to get to the 120 calories. But you see how much of it, how much of it is uh, fat 
100% of the olive oil is fat, like I mentioned, all oils are 100% fat, right? But with the olives, only 20% of it is fat, of those whole foods. And then you can also see the olives have the added benefit of all that extra fiber. So when, um, when thinking about, um, you know, making dressings and things like that, um, I, it's really nice to actually blend um, nuts or seeds and make dressings from that. Like I will blend raw cashews with water and salt or um, some garlic blended in a blender and makes a delicious dressing. And it's very minimally processed, right? Just the blending. And you've got the healthy fats from those foods rather than just straight oil. All right, so um, the same goes with like ghee and, um, and butter as well. All right, so they're, they're basically 100% fat. Um, and just another picture of what 500 calories, you know, looks like in your actual belly, right? To make, get an idea of, of um, what it ends up doing in your, in your stomach, oil only fills up a tiny amount. So 500 calories of oil is very small. And then cheese, a little bit more than that. Meat, it fills up your belly just a little bit more. And then potatoes, rice and beans and fruits and veggies, you see, just 500 calories of it can fill up your whole belly. So that's why when you eat more of the whole plant-based foods, it keeps you satisfied because when your belly is full, it sends messages to your brain saying that, uh, you know, hey, I'm full, we don't need to eat anymore, okay? But when you eat the oil and the cheese and um, say you, you know, um, you're busy and you go for uh, fast food, you know, you get, you get a burger through the drive-thru, um, when it all adds up, those foods are very high in calories, but they may not fully satisfy you. So you have the oil, you've got cheese, um, you've got meat in there, but it might, you know, by the time your stomach's full, you might have had maybe 1,500 calories. All right, so it's important to um, think about. Uh, now, how, how do you get started? So um, eating this way, uh, so basically you want to try to have, you know, half your plate be uh, vegetables and fruits and then the other half, you know, legumes, so beans, chickpeas, lentils, and grains. I also recommend, you know, half your plate be vegetables and then you have fruit on the side. So, um, and then this is the same picture as before, but with roughly how many servings I recommend or how many servings you want to aim for. Um, sometimes, oftentimes, you know, even I don't get you know, hit all these servings of everything, but it's really good goal to aim for. Um, and when I'm talking about a serving, um, I mean, like, you don't have to weigh it out or anything like that. Just consider a rough handful, right? One serving of bread is one slice of bread, for instance. And then when it comes to the top there, the fats and oils, you really just want to limit it to just a small handful of nuts and seeds total for the whole day. So if you eat half an avocado, that fulfills your healthy fats for the day. Um, you shouldn't, in general, be overdoing it on other nuts and seeds, All right? So, and then here also, you know, leafy greens, they have their own category because they're just really, really so good for you. All right, so, Basically, you want to use foods that don't require um, an ingredients list, right? So um, you've maybe heard the term, you want to shop the perimeter of the store. So you want to go in the, in the produce section. You know, apples don't require an ingredients list. You don't have to turn around and find out to see what's in it, right? So those foods that are packaged and processed in bags or boxes, always look at the ingredients list. The fewer the ingredients, the better. And you want to avoid the foods that um, contain, you know, oil and, and sugar and things like that. And you want to only include foods that, in, that have the um, whole plant foods as much as possible. And then on top of that, if you're trying to lose weight, you know, you should be looking at um, the ingredients to see if there is any oil, um, any added oils and things like that. So, um, and then, you know, eating the rainbow. So uh, the the more colorful your fruits or vegetables, the more nutrients there are in them. And um, beyond just the nutrients that I listed, there are actually a lot more. There's some phyto, phytochemicals and all these other um, uh, substances found in them 
that have various benefits. Um, so we should really just aim to eat the rainbow and have a, a diverse uh, array of foods. And, and then, like I said, you wanna aim for half the plate roughly to be um, vegetables. So with Indian cooking, you know, um, traditionally, uh, there's a lot of dishes that are actually vegetarian already. So um, any, any sauteed vegetables and things like that are already, um, already uh, whole food essentially. And um, then also, uh, is it your, your lentils, you know, dal, things like that. That's also a whole, whole food that you use because India is typically when in traditional cooking, we use the um, whole foods. We have our little containers of, of the whole uh, legumes or the whole grains and we do that. So it's a lot easier actually for us to, um, to switch to whole food plant-based. But one of the big things is sauteing with water instead of oil and also avoiding deep frying things. Um, again, because we want to get away from oil because it can have a lot of saturated fat, which then leads to heart disease, right? And so the other thing is you can try to replace your meat dishes with bean dishes or legume dishes or dal and that type of thing, but season it the same exact way, you know, uh, the same exact spices that you would use for the meat dish, try to incorporate that into your um, bean curry or, or whatnot. And the other thing is just replacing basmati rice or jasmine rice or other processed rice with, with whole brown rice. Um, and then avoid cooking uh, you know, with, with coconut oil as much as possible, like we said, because that's the most unhealthy oil. So I would recommend if you're gonna cook with oil, try to cook with olive oil and just use a spray can so you use only a small amount. Um, and then replacing you know, cow's milk and, and yogurt with non-dairy milk. There are a lot of, um, of dairy-free creamers out there these days, a um, lot of ones that are very delicious. And so replacing that really does um, make a change because you cut out all of the, um, the fat that's found in milk, um, the cholesterol that's found in milk, and um, the protein casein that's found in milk also that's linked with cancer. So you, you get rid of a lot of that. And then in the place of that, you're having, um, even if it's processed, even if it's like soy milk, you're still getting, um, you're not getting any of that bad stuff from the dairy. Now, when it comes to vitamins, right? So, excuse me. So for vitamins, um, the, the only ones that I actually recommend supplementing are uh, B12 and vitamin D. So vitamin B12, that's actually made by bacteria found in soil. It's not something that's made in the flesh of animals. It's not something that was already there. So animals actually get their B12 from soil and their food feed is actually supplemented with it. Um, the same thing is actually true with um, cow's milk. So, you know, milk is actually supplemented with B12. It's not naturally found in, in cow's milk. Um, and then vitamin D. So regardless of diet, you know, 99% of the people that I check vitamin D levels on are very deficient in it. So vitamin D is something that's synthesized in the skin and it depends on sun exposure. So we just don't absorb it very well. And, you know, back in the day, way back in the day when people were roaming the Sahara Desert, you know, with very little clothes on, they were getting so much more vitamin D. So as it turns out, the amount that might be optimal for us, it actually may be a lot higher than what we consider normal. Um, so I just recommend an easy vitamin D supplement and um, like a 1000 to 2000 international units of it a day. Um, but that's easy to, to take. And then some more tips, you know, Basically, when you're eating this way, you want to really listen to your body. So when you're hungry, eat. And then when you're full, stop eating. Um, if, you are, if you eat more slowly, you'll be able to tell when you're full more easily. So you just want to just listen to your body. And when you're hungry, you want to eat it, eat food. And, um, and if you're surrounded by those whole plant foods, that's what you'll reach for when you're hungry. And then you want to also try to start your meals either with a salad or, or a, a light soup or, or fruit. Um, you can, that's an easy way to kind of add, add whole foods to your diet easily. And then try to omit oil as we discussed. And um, the other big thing is 
you know, it's how you eat the majority of the time that determines your health rather than how you eat the minority of the time. So, um, so say you can eat, you know, whole food plant-based 75% of the time and, you know, 25% of the time you're, you're eating um, non-veg. Um, any shift, any shift at all is, is really beneficial for your health. And so what this means is that, you know, on your birthday or on New Year's or on, you know, Easter or Thanksgiving, that doesn't mean that you don't have to um, deprive yourself if what you really want to eat is, is meat or other foods. As long as for the rest of the year, you're doing the best you can to try to eat as healthy as possible, your body's actually able to handle a little bit of meat here and there. That's how we evolved as humans. So that's fine. You don't need to you know, switch anything overnight or anything like that. Um, and then a little bit about, you know, motivation. So the goal is really progress, not perfection. Um, so for me, for instance, um, I found out, I came across the research um, and the evidence for a plant-based diet quite a few years ago, I want to say maybe like seven years ago or so when I was in medical school. And um, it took me about five years to actually cut out animal products. And it's only been two years that I haven't had any cheese or dairy or anything like that. So I tell people all the time, you know, it, it, it took me like five years. And um, so it's not something that someone should expect to just change overnight. Um, so you have to be really patient with yourself. And the goal is really progress, you know, not perfection. And then small, very consistent changes in your diet are more sustainable than big changes. And then also, you know, you want to remind yourself of why. At the end of the day, like I said, why do we care about what we eat? It turns out we are, we are what we eat. You know, the biggest predictor of how we'll die, how we leave this planet is what we put into our bodies. And so um, if we want to live our lives with good quality of life, you know, if we want to avoid ending up in a wheelchair, if we want to avoid amputations from diabetic ulcers, um, if we want to stay physically fit and active, um, if we want to have a healthy spine, if we want to avoid arthritis, all of these food, uh, you know, all of these things, um, there's a reason why, right? It's because we want to, we want to be around for our, our children, our grandchildren. Um, we want to be able to play with them without having to, you know, take breaks. We want to be able to keep up with them and be around for our loved ones uh, for as long as we can. So I find it a, it's really important to remind yourself of your, of your why. Um, so when I was transitioning, there was not a single person in my, um, you know, no one in my life that was eating this way. And so um, I found that it was really important to remind myself why. Um, and so for me, for me, I want to, you know, I'm a doctor and I'm trying to prevent disease. I'm trying to help people. That's my biggest goal, right? And so I found that if I am able to, um, if I am able to walk the walk, you know, that helps me most of all to help my patients. So um, you always have to think about why, why you want to be healthy at the end of the day. Um, all right, and then, um, and then the big thing is you wanna shift your mindset from living to eat to eat to live. Um, so a lot of people, you know, um, they just live to look forward to their next meal, you know, lunch, you know, dinner. It's like, what, you know, what's, what's, what's there to eat? What are we going to eat? Um, but when we think about this, there's nothing wrong with revolving around food. Um, you know, I'm not criticizing that, but you want to be eating in order to um, support your best life possible. So you want to shift that mindset from living to eat to eating really to live. And then the biggest thing is, you know, health comes from healthy living. Health does not come from a pill. Health does not come from a supplement. You know, health comes from healthy living. And other than nutrition, uh, one of the biggest things is also physical activity. Exercise is huge. Um, so sleep and um, stress, all of these things really do affect um, our health. And so it's really important to think of all the thing, all the ways in our life where we're able to, um, you know, go back to the way things were back in the day when people walked more and you know they were more physically active and they ate more food from the ground and um, they had better social connections and, and all of that. So 
Um, so my experience, I also sh I already shared a little bit of it, um, but in, in my clinic, I have been able to, you know, take patients off of their um, blood pressure medications, off of their diabetic medications. I even had the opportunity to um, uh, take someone off of their insulin, uh, which is huge, you know, because many people think that these diseases are something they're going to live with for the rest of their life. Um, but um, I've been able to see some really great progress in my practice. And so I just love to be able to share it with others. Um, so I just want to share also some more uh, resources if you're interested. So nutritionfacts.org is a fantastic website. Um, and then you see there, How Not to Die as a book written by Dr. Michael Greger. So um, Dr. Michael Greger, he um, started that website, nutritionfacts.org. And um, it just has very short, you know, two to four minute videos on various topics, but it's all evidence-based. So it goes through the evidence and it's easy for any of us to understand. Um, and then you, there's actually a new journal for those who are more science-minded. Um, if you want to look at actual articles where people can um, submit their case studies and things on on reversing or treating um, diabetes and, and these other conditions. There's another one called Physicians Committee for Responsible Medicine that I'm also a member of. Uh, again, they advocate a whole food plant-based diet and there are a few more other things. So then there's also the eCornell Plant-Based Nutrition Certificate, um, which is what I got online. Uh, but anyone can actually um, go on there and um, get this certificate. Um, if they'd like to, if they'd like to learn more. So this is that website, nutritionfacts.org. Um, I highly, highly recommend this site. If you're, you know, looking for, does turmeric work for arthritis, for instance, type that in and there will probably be a video on it. Um, and then the website um, for the Physicians Committee for Responsible Medicine, PCRM, um, they actually have a 21 day vegan kickstart and so um, free, free, it's completely free and there's um, the whole menu and there's the shopping list and, and all of that as well. Um, and then that was the journal that I mentioned, the International Journal of Disease Reversal and Prevention. It is very new, just the last um, few years. And then a recipe, so there are plenty of recipes online. Um, there are a lot of these um, websites here um, can really help out. But I find that, you know, if you just type in whole food plant-based anything, um, so like whole food plant-based lasagna, so that means lasagna without the cheese and um, without the meat, you know, um, without all the oil. So um, there, are, there are plenty of um, resources online. We live in a time where we're able to access so much information just at our fingertips. So also on YouTube, there is a, if you actually type in whole food plant-based there, I found this guy there, um, this, this man who um, he's been posting videos on all these, you know, um, North Indian uh, whole food plant-based recipes. And so there's, there's a lot of options for Indian food as well. But in general, if you, you just make the same food, but mine, you know, take out the oil and you take out the ghee and things like that. Um, then you have uh, a few apps as well. So this one on the left, the Daily Dozen app, you can actually keep a track of um, 12 of the major kind of food groups. And they also include water and exercise there and your vitamin um, B12 and vitamin D. But you can tick off um, how many servings of it you have, you've had to see how you're doing in terms of getting the optimal amount of, um, of these nutrients. And then on the right side is the Forks Over Knives recipe app. Um, there's so many recipes on there for like condiments and sauces and wraps and um, desserts, um, really delicious desserts as well. Um, and then another thing I highly recommend, are, there's a few documentaries as well. Um, one of the more recent ones is called The Game Changers. And um, that's a picture of it there. But uh, there's also Forks Over Knives, Eating You Alive, and What the Health. Um, so I highly recommend these as well. Um, they feature a lot of the uh, doctors who really pioneered this diet and who speak out about it. And um, so just know that they're all evidence-based. 
Um, and this was the uh, plant-based nutrition course that, um, that I completed during um, my residency training. Uh, and this was the book that I highly, highly recommend. I actually gifted it to a lot of my friends and family um, for Christmas one year. And then, so I think that's about it. Um, does anyone have any questions? All right, thank you so much, Dr. Christina Turin. Um, actually, like it was very, very informative session, mm -hmm. uh, very detailed presentation. Uh, I think most of the questions that I got in the chat box, you already addressed it. Um, so, but you know, um, please feel free to uh, send me your uh, name if you have any questions and I'll be uh, calling your name and you can unmute yourself and then ask her the question. Uh, and Christina, if you can stop your screen share, then you will be pinned. Um, that way, you know, people can see your face more than the presentation. So that yeah. would be great. There you go. Perfect. All right. So, you know, as I said, most of the questions that I got so far has been addressed. Uh, but still, um, I would like to start with one question, which says it won't be easy for a non-vegetarian to make a switch into vegan diet, which, of course, you know, we can all agree to that. So what is your personal experience going through that phase? And what are the few things that you can um, do to make sure that you will get that satisfaction of eating meat, but you know, actually you're not eating meat yourself. So they want to know your personal experience of switching yeah. from a non-vegetarian diet into a vegan diet. Yeah. So um, for my family who knows me very well, and you know my siblings, they may know that uh, I used to be a big fan of chicken curry. <laughs> Okay. Um, yes. a really big fan of chicken curry. In fact, so much so that I used to leave very little for my siblings when we used to, um, when we used to eat food. So I used to be a huge, you know, I, I was a big chicken curry fan, for instance, and I, and I ate everything under the sun, you know? Um, so for me, um, the, there were actually a few, few factors. So the biggest thing would be, uh, nutrition. Um, but, I found that when I was um, studying for one of my, um, for the MCAT, I believe in medical, or you know, for the, one of the board exams in medical school, um, that I was really struggling with getting into like a habit or routine. And I came across um, a book that I had read on self-control. And I found that, you know, um, if you practice it in one area, it really helps in all aspects of your life. And so I really wanted to become more disciplined <laughs> with studying. And I had thought about going vegetarian for a while. So I looked into it and then that's when I came across all this information. And for me, the biggest thing is I, I want to be able to, I, I want to have really good quality of life. As a, as a doctor, you know, and have worked in the hospitals and everything before, one of my first patients in my new practice was a stroke patient. And they had no sensation, you know, no, no, like just weakness of one side of the whole body. And um, I saw that and I said, you know, well, I never want to get there, you know. So the biggest thing for me, the biggest motivator would be, you know, if there's any family history of these things, it's really important to know that anyone could be next when it comes to heart attacks. You know, silent heart attacks and things happen. Even if your stress test is perfectly normal, it's possible for you to actually um, die of a heart attack or stroke. It's our number one killer, right? And um, I also want to really avoid disability. You know, I don't want to have crippling arthritis when I get older. I want to be able to um, do what I enjoy doing. I want to be able to travel. I want to be able to spend time with my loved ones. Um, and if I'm sick, I'm not going to be able to do that. So uh, for me, I um, my biggest thing was you know, I think it was maybe easier for me because I, as a doctor, um, day in and day out, you see people coming in for diabetes and heart disease and all these things, and they never get better. You know, you just keep putting them on medications. So when I came across this information, I thought, hey, this is a reason for me to keep going down this path and actually have a purpose in medicine, um, because I I could be the one to take people off of their medications, you know? So for me, that was the biggest thing. I want to avoid developing diabetes um, because I have a huge family history of it, right? And I want to also promote it in, um, in 
in my life. So for me, in terms of meat, you know, substituting chicken and things like that, um, I, I honestly, I just like, I left it and I, I don't know, I, 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 I think I, I see, the thing is like, as an Indian, you, you tend to season your food a lot more. And so seasoning it, I think with spices and things like that mm-hmm. are the best way to kind of uh, replicate that need for it and eating a lot more of your whole grains and, and beans and things like that mm-hmm. will keep you fill, fill, um, full um, mm-hmm. more. Um, yeah, so what I understand from your personal experience is it's like more important to set a personal goal as a first step. Okay. Yeah. Got yeah. It. So I think you have to really find out because there's no reason for, you know, like if you're not interested in your health, then don't change the diet, right? right. You have yeah. to have a reason for it. Yeah, so, so, so it's like some one of my patients like, oh yeah, I had, I had a, you know, my aunt had, my aunt had kidney disease and it was horrible, you know, and mm-hmm. so the leading causes of kidney disease diabetes right mm-hmm. so the people have their motivations you know Got everyone it. knows somebody who's died from these diseases mm-hmm. um and it's really just a matter of time as far as when um when you develop it so it's really important to prevent as much as possible Got but it. um but yeah i would say finding your finding your why is the yes. most important thing All right. So moving on to our next question. Um, It's from Anjali Peter. She's asking, it was a very informative session. Is there any way we can get your PowerPoint as her question? Thank you, Anjali, for the question. So one thing I want to uh, let everyone know before she answers is that we will be uh, sharing this recording in Facebook. So that will be one thing. And beyond that, if you want to add something, uh, Christina. Yeah, so um, yeah, I'd absolutely love to, you know, this is my, my passion. And if anyone needs any, um, I was actually going to include, um, we can include some of my personal information if anyone would like to contact me as well. Um, I'm also taking new patients, uh, if anyone is interested, but it is in the St. Pete um, area. Uh, but yeah, I would be happy to share all of this information. And if anyone has any other questions specifically about different foods or anything like that yes um, so another to... question that i got is isn't it indian diet high carb diet and if so why do we have high diabetes yeah so um we have a high rate of diabetes um i think for multiple reasons so the um there is quite a lot of fat in our diet and so the other thing is um like I talked about, you know, insulin resistance, that is actually the biggest thing. Um, But we also have dairy in our diet still. um, And so that does increase it. And then also, um, uh, diabetes is a little bit more complex than that. Um, So refined carbs, refined sugars, and things like that also play a role. On top of that, um, Indians, for some reason, and especially when we come to the U.S., are at a higher risk for developing um, diabetes. We're not exactly sure, you know, there may be some more um, like genetic um, aspect to it. But at the end of the day, um, if we have to do what we can do or can control, you know, we can't control anything. We can't control, you know, uh, genetics or anything like that. Um, But there's lots of uh, diabetic patients who, when they cut out, you know, the ghee and the the milk or the eggs and things like that. So eggs also a lot of fat, lots of cholesterol. They're able to reverse their diabetes. All right. So So there's one more question. I mean, we are short on time. I'm trying to include everybody uh, as much as possible. Uh, So this is another question from Rajni John. She's asking in growing children who's like six to 10 years old, is it advisable to remove milk, which is 2% milk uh, from their diet? It's a question from Rajni. Thank you, Rajni, for the question, Uh, Christina. Yeah, so it is absolutely advisable. So like I said, there's actually no nutrients in, um, in either meat, dairy, or, or eggs that you cannot get from um, whole plant foods. Um, so the calcium, for instance, that's a big thing that people get concerned about um, with dairy. Uh, but you, uh, as we see, you know, we can actually get, um, get calcium from many other sources in the, um, in the plant-based diet. So as long as you're eating a wide variety of foods, which yes, it's, it's hard for, um, for uh, kids, you know, sometimes to eat a proper variety of foods, 
Um, but I do advise taking that out because on top of that, you know, countries that drink more milk actually have more fractures, so worse bone health. So I do advise against milk as much as possible. Okay. And there is another question. Uh, I don't know who this is from because name is not mentioned. Um, they were asking like eating beans and legumes so much, will it cause acidicity in people? Uh, will that be a big issue? Um, gas problems. That's what they are asking. Okay. Yeah. So gas. Um, yeah. This is something, uh, a question I get a lot. Uh, you know, it kind of uh, bloats people a lot. So there are, um, the reason for this, uh, there may be a few different things, but you have bacteria in your gut that actually digest your food for you. And so we have kind of like good bacteria and bad bacteria. And, and um, if we eat a wide variety of plant foods, we have a wide variety of that good bacteria. So for a certain type of bean, it helps to digest that. Um, but sometimes if we don't have the right amount of bacteria in our gut just yet, it will it will cause that kind of bloating and things like that, especially initially. So you want to just um, taper it up slowly. So even just like a tablespoon or, or two, you know, it takes four to six weeks for our gut microbiome to actually shift mm -hmm. um, to the good bacteria. Mm -hmm. um, and so it can take about that time. Mm -hmm. um, and so soaking, I think also in uh, baking soda might help with cutting down on some of the uh, starchiness and then soaking in general um, can help to bring down the, um, that, the, the bloating and that type of thing. Okay. And another one is, I think it's for our side to answer. It's a question from Abraham Chatham Parampil. Can we get a link for recorded sessions? So as I mentioned before, we will try to share this recording in Facebook. Um, so I think generally those are the questions and I want to ask everyone and we had more than 50 plus people join today. Thank you so much. I mean, I really appreciate you all taking time uh, to join and then, um, you know, get informed about these things because uh, most of us, we don't look into these facts. So if there is anybody else who want to ask a question, um, please go ahead. Now we have five more minutes remaining. Uh, go ahead, unmute yourself, say your name, and if you can ask the questions, uh, we can do that, or else we are winding up the session. Hi, Dr. Christina. I have one question. My name is Mary Vada, madam, and my question is, what's your take on uh, juicing versus uh, smoothie making? Yeah. In, uh... Okay, go ahead. Yeah, so that's a great question. Um, so in general, it's better to have the smoothie rather than the juice, because when you have the juice, uh, when you make the juice, you actually remove all the fiber out of the um, out of the, the the fruit or or the you know the greens, and so. Um, but in general, it's not um, really bad per se. Um, but you want to, as much as possible, use the whole food, and so that would be still contained in the blended smoothie. Um, but if you're just having like a green juice here and there, then you're getting all those nutrients, and if if you weren't drinking that green juice, if you weren't, you know, um, if that helps you to get those nutrients, then that's fine. If your alternative is eating all the, you know, the celery and things like that by, um, you know, just in their whole food form and you wouldn't normally do that. And um, if, if juicing helps you to get those nutrients, then that's, that's fine. Thank you very much. Can I follow up with uh, one thing that is uh, someone with a problem with any kind of colitis or anything, ulcerative colitis and things like that, where fiber is an issue, juicing would be better to for better absorption of nutrients, don't you think? So um, that's a little bit more uh, complex. I don't know if I have the answer to that, but fiber, um, fiber is what our bacteria actually feeds on. So it doesn't eat anything like it, it we need it, um, we need fiber in order for our gut microbiome to actually survive. Um, so it feeds solely on fiber. Fiber is only found in plant foods, right? So I would not recommend of cutting the fiber out. Um, so symptomatically, sometimes people will have issues with these like fiber containing foods, especially the raw foods that are not cooked enough and that type of thing. So when they have these diseases, it's a process of recovery. You know, so whatever they can do to in initially to get those nutrients in is fine as much as they can tolerate. But over time, the goal should always be to get to whole plant foods in whatever form they're able to consume them. Thank you very much. No problem. Very, ni very nice presentation. Okay. Thank you so much. Okay. 
um, is there anybody else or else I think like um, we can wind up our presentation. Is there anybody yeah, else? Yeah, I'm Biju Thonu Kadavilana. One minute on the other one. Yeah, I'm sorry. 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 i am sorry 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 from my experience, I, I myself uh, lost 60 pounds uh, in 2007. I don't know if you remember me before that, but I was 60 pounds heavier than uh, uh, right now. Okay, so I, I lost my entire weight by dieting, not by exercise. I tried to do, you know, by exercise, but it didn't work. So I had to diet. I cut, cut off meat completely, and then I lived on... It, in six to seven months, I lost uh, almost 55 pounds and then, you know, eventually 60 pounds. So, but it is, it's a struggle, you know, every day is a struggle. Uh, the most, uh, uh, you know, pic the, the picture that caught my attention was how you showed the, the belly that, sh that shows how the, the oil fills up your, your belly and the, the weight. So that tells you a lot. So, you know, the more vegetable you eat, the, the more full you feel and then the less fat you get. So yeah. that picture really, you know, speaks, I, I guess, maybe a, a 10,000 words, right? So thank you so much, Kristen, and everyone who joined. I, I know uh, many uh, people from former joined, so thank you so much. Uh, um, and then I think uh, we may have another session if, if we, you know, uh, uh, find uh, Christina, I mean, uh, uh, time, right? And then uh, we would love to do another session to follow up and see how you know, if we can change one person, right? That that's a great achievement, I think. So thank you so much, Christina. And then Anina, back to you. Thank you so much. Yeah, I also had so many eye-opening uh, instances during the presentations. But, I mean, those pictures were speaking so loud. So um, I think like we can conclude this session for now. But as our president mentioned, maybe later on, whenever it's uh, convenient for Dr. Christina and. If there is much interest, we'll be having another session. Um, so uh, we're concluding our session for today right now. Um, thank you so much, each and everyone who joined today. And a special thanks to Dr. Christina Turian. That was an awesome presentation. And hopefully we'll be meeting soon in the coming months. Thank you all and have a great weekend. Bye. Thank you so much. Take care, everyone. Thank you. Thank you.